Have you checked the Hey everyone, welcome to the Horror Show. I'm Cecil Laird. And got Jaime and Fuego here. And we are back to do another new movie review. And this is one that I'm guessing Fuego might have been a bit more excited than me about, just based on the origin material. Um, but this is something that we did a trailer reaction for recently, and all of us were pretty excited based on the trailer. So, what are we here to talk about, Fuego? Well, uh, long days, pleasant nights, all that silliness. Uh, it's not like technically a Hail the Stephen King episode. But yeah, we're talking about the 2022 version of Firestarter, which, you know, I think one of the biggest things about this particular property, because there is the 84 film with Drew Barrymore, and then they even did uh, the Marguerite Moreau, whatever her name is, from the Mighty Ducks and What Hot American Summer sequel, which had Malcolm McDowell and was made for sci-fi. It was all right, you know, but even back to the 1980 book, I... I've never been like super hot about this property to begin with, huh? super hot. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I was excited based on really the fact that the young lady that they cast was so kick-ass in that uh, most recent season of American Horror Story. And also Keith Thomas, the director of a film from a year, year and a half ago called The Vigil, was directing and Blumhouse producing. I was like, this has serious potential. Trailer looked good. Um, but I was, I was a bit underwhelmed, unfortunately. It did not live up to the expectation that I unfortunately fell into on this one. So what did you think, man? Yeah, honestly, I was really hoping I was going to like it more. But as I sat through it, I just kind of a little bit grew more and more frustrated with it because there wasn't really a whole lot going on. Like, we had this issue with another movie recently where... It's a very, very thin plot when it boils down to it, right? It's it's a, a family on the run from unknown people. And that's it. And you don't even really get that much of a backstory of why. And you get, like, all these random people introduced on the bad guy side. But it's obviously someone that's kind of trying to get the band back together. Who, like, it seems like they draw it up like she wasn't even originally involved in everything. And so it's like... Why are we supposed to care about this character when no one else in the in the organization seems to care about this character? But there's there's a lot of other issues I had with it. I mean, the effects were okay. I thought the acting was fine. Yeah. But yeah, I didn't really care about it. Like I wanted to see how it ended up because I was hoping there would be, you know, a big explosive finale. And I guess I kind of got that, but I mean, that was like the most interesting part of the movie. Everything else was just a, a little bit I don't know, just lackluster to me. Yeah, having reread the book like a year or so ago, it this is one that I feel like functions actually a lot better on paper because even the 84 original is just kind of, it's slow. And, and, and like, especially in the middle portion, you know, where you're just kind of just waiting for something to happen. I guess they're, they're on the run, as you mentioned, but it's it, I, it, at least in the, in the text of the King original novel, it explores the aspects of the experimentation and it goes into, you know, deeper detail about all of that. Whereas this felt very much like a trimming down, going through the motions. And I, I, I must admit that I, I made the mistake of rewatching the original one this past week. And so mm. I couldn't, I couldn't help but compare that film is about like 20, 25 minutes longer. And yes, it, it does meander and it's slow and takes its time to develop, but I felt like it had better character development, which as you said, this film really lacks, unfortunately. I didn't hate this movie or anything like that, but yeah, I, I wanted to like it so much more. And it, I, I mean, the Carpenter score was cool. Yeah. You know, I, I, I dug that. I agree. And if, and if that's what I'm, you know, making as one of my main positives that's where <laughs> that's that's not good good terrain to be in so. well yeah i mean <laughs> it, it, it is a positive for it but yeah i mean it's it's like the movie was kind of being held aloft a little bit by the score because there's not a lot going on and so you really take notice of the score <laughs> yeah which yeah. you know isn't always the best thing for a film but it, yeah and it also had kind of the the pet cemetery 2019 sort of vibe going where they just wanted it to look darker and feel darker in like vibe and tone and stuff and you know to just i don't know some of the color correction and the fact that and to, it, it felt super dark yeah yeah i yeah, was in the was theater i'm like i can't believe how much i'm struggling to, to see some of this stuff and it's like 
not just because they're in a cave and a, and a, and a torch is the only bit of lighting the filmmaker's using. No, these are actual scenes that were lit on set that just, for whatever reason, everything got toned so far down in post, I guess. Yeah. Because there's no way they would have been okay with this muddy of an image the day of as they're recording. Like, I can't imagine that. So I don't know why they decided to do the way they did as far as that goes. So, yeah. We're touching on a lot already, but yeah. I guess let's just... Sorry. We don't have to take forever with everything, but go ahead. You know the story. Go ahead. Give it up. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a, it's a relatively simple one. There's a, a couple who meet in a college testing sort of bit where the shop who show up in a few different King stories like The Mist and, and various others, but they're this secretive governmental organization and they're testing something called Lot 6, which has uh, potential like telekinetic, pyrokinetic, like a just psychic sort of super powery type abilities. And, you know, half of the people in this test course are getting just water and the other half are actually getting the the real experimental stuff and Zac Efron and his wife Sydney Lemon Lemon um, she was on that Hellstrom show is what she's most known for but yeah so each of them actually get a real dose and then they have a daughter by the name of Charlie and she has a little bit of both of their abilities which was a slight variance from the original film and from the source material so they did story-wise take some liberties which I know some King fans are going to be very upset with most notably with so uh, Michael Grayeyes, who plays Rainbird, originally played by George C. Scott in the in the first adaptation back in '84, always was a Native American, but they altered his motives and intentions and his backstory pretty significantly, actually. Hmm. And I know a lot of King fans are going to have some major issues with that. It's a different turn of the wheel, level of the tower, as we always say. But uh, yeah, that was something as this vengeful dude who's trying to track her down for the shop as they're on the run and have been for a while, Zac Efron being the father and everything after some stuff goes down with the mom. So it is, at the end of the day, a very simple story. And even an elderly guy who assists them at one particular point, that guy had a much larger role in the book and in the original adaptation, and it's it's condensed. Like Everything about the storytelling in this was significantly trimmed down and condensed, and they were trying to get it in that 90-minute sweet spot. And I don't know with how dense the source material is if that if that was the right move but they're they're trying to appeal to the younger blumhouse generation you know and so that's that's why so so i had some issues with the alterations i understood why they did it but it just felt thin a lot of the time and you know especially with the character development back to what you would you would mention a moment ago so yeah i agree i mean that's why i said earlier it felt like the story wasn't very deep and so i got kind of bored and it just you know there wasn't as much to grasp onto because i didn't care about a lot of the characters because of that lack of development like you said but speaking of the characters let's talk about the acting yeah i thought that the little girl did a good job again i liked her in the American Horror Story season that she was in. But to me, the adults were all kind of... I mean, Zac Efron did an okay job, but I kind of yeah. expected him to do a little more than he did somehow. I mean, he played the concerned father just fine, but I guess maybe it was in the way he was written, but it seemed like he had three modes in the whole movie. It was stare-down mode, uh, it was fatherly mode, and then it was occasionally super angry father, like for out of nowhere kind of thing. And mm -hmm. so it was an uneven grouping of material that he was forced to deal with based on the script. So I feel like he was oddly restrained in what he was able to bring to the role as a result of that. But the mom was fine, and everyone else, I didn't, I didn't really, wasn't a big fan of the corporate woman that was sort of kind of the Amanda Waller, you know, for people that, that get the reference from Suicide Squad, you know? <laughs> the person trying to organize the bad guys and all that stuff. So I guess I was just kind of ho-hum on the acting. I kind of was too, and it, it's probably back to, you know, just the way that they weren't given an immense amount of amazing lines, really. I mean, the film actually starts with no dialogue at all for like the first few minutes, which I thought was an interesting, deliberate sort of, sort of take, but... Yeah, Efron was fine. I, I, I think the biggest comparison that I can make between this and the 84 version is the fact that there wasn't really as much of a sweetness of chemistry between the, the father and the daughter, which was like a real hallmark of the original film. They were obviously going for a darker take, which I get it, 
uh, uh, Ryan Kira Armstrong, who was great on AHS, but she was also playing a darker character there. She brought the same bit here. And I don't know if there is as much levity to her take on Charlie. It was much more, as opposed to Drew Barrymore had that like sweetness about her at various times throughout that original film. Like, like Ryan Kira was just like, the whole time just pretty much brooding and sad and it was i don't want to say more of an emo take but and and, and she played it well you know I, I'm, I'm not going to take that away from her but it definitely distinguished itself from the the sweetness of the source material in the original film that uh, michael gray is having a, a, a native american actor actually playing the role of rainbird proper i thought he was good but he didn't have enough to do he didn't have enough development and, uh, and enough scenes especially with his weird new backstory of actually being a test subject himself, uh, which was not a part of the original stuff. So, so that was different. And uh, and lastly, the fact that we only get Red Foreman in like one scene as our scientist dude that uh, wasn't so into that. I I, I just wanted more. I, I wanted this film to be longer and better developed. And I, I feel like with all the acting talent involved with this, they could have brought it had they been you know afforded the opportunity. So yeah, I think we were lacking a certain amount of time with the family before the shit starts hitting the fan. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it starts so early that we don't have a time to even really get to know the family as a loving family. It starts off with a nightmare and then flashes forward with, again, like you said, her already, the daughter already kind of brooding and, <clears throat> you know, concerned about what she feels like is coming in the, in the near future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and and we also had like a focus on bullying, and I know that it's it's a big thing, and Hollywood is most definitely trying to put more emphasis on it. But none of that stuff, you know, was in the source material, and that's probably another thing that King fans are going to be like, why did they decide to focus on this? It it felt kind of unnecessary because it happens twice in the film actually. Mm -hmm. And I saw somebody joking, or, because there's there's a lot of critics crapping on this one already. A oh, lot really? of contemporaries are being really mean to this film, and I. I didn't hate it. Like I said, you know, I, I I thought it was fine. You know, it was solid at times, and I will get into maybe some of the things here in a moment that that I believe it did well, most notably some of the effects. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, yeah, I thought the acting just didn't didn't give this great cast enough time. So no, I agree. Uh, so yeah, let's. I mean, we might as well jump into the effects. I mean, it, it it was good. What I liked was they did a really good job of when she was getting, you know, out of control and things started to heat up around her. You could see the 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 waviness of the air, yep. you know, and like all those little touches that were obviously CG touches that would be really hard to have accomplished back in the old version of it. You know, I felt like that lent itself to making it look more you know, like, not only what would really be happening, but also more ominous. You know, the, the wavy air is is a really cool function in the film as far as helping to describe what's going on in the scene. So, I don't know, I like the way the effects were working for the movie throughout, let alone the, the actual explosions and fire of it all. Yeah, yeah, where she goes all Dark Phoenix and stuff. I mm -hmm. thought, thought it was solid. The bathroom scene was cool when we get that early on and, you know, the door being blasted off. And also, I, I have to mention the, the makeup effects because that was one thing that they were boasting early on. They're like, yeah, well, the original fire starter didn't actually... They had a lot of people on fire and running around and whatnot and lots of explosions. And, and that is one thing about the 84 film, way more just blowing things up and just from... from uh, just a, a scale of you could kind of tell this was made during covid because there, there weren't really a lot of people in a lot of scenes compared to that 84 film where you have so many people from the shop and so many cars blowing up and all this different stuff but just seeing the after effects of the burning like the mother's arms at that particular mm -hmm. point and, and the guy in the car when you see the yeah. side of his face yeah everything. there was that some good stuff, practical don't get me wrong was, yeah yeah that stuff was well done but Sadly, we didn't get an abundance of it, and I feel like maybe it would have been more entertaining and interesting with this thinner, you know, plotting if they had more, you know, evidences of that carnage, more examples of it, so. Was the tropey bit that happened with a particular animal from I the, laughed, from the I book? Laughed, I, I, uh, uh, he, they, he, she, they, the cat? Yeah. I mean, no, that's not, it's not if I recall from 
from the book with her just getting upset about the scratching. Because I, I thought of you when that scene happened, and I'm like, oh, that's going to upset Cecil. I was not happy with it. Yeah. As far as the cinematography and filmmaking goes, I do want to make sure we touch on that. I thought mm -hmm. it was a well enough made movie. It just was so dark, in the like we already touched on. Mm -hmm. It was hard to appreciate it at times. But uh, overall, I mean, I thought it was shot well enough. What about you? Yeah, I mean, like I said, I enjoyed the vigil a lot, which is what got me even more excited about this. And yet, Keith Thomas, the director, he took a lot of his style from that as far as like massive color correction, lots of blues and darker colors and stuff. And I just don't know if it worked as, as well for this. I mean, maybe for that, that brooding, darker sort of vibe compared to the original that they were trying to distinguish themselves from, but still well shot. And there's, there's one scene in particular where Charlie is getting to her destination in the third act and you're looking up at this like spirally stairwell sort of stuff. So there, there was some interesting shot selection and uh, the, the action when we actually got it was was pretty solid so i'm not going to fault him on that and I'm, I'm he's still a director on my radar most definitely music wise i guess we haven't touched on that right uh john carpenter you mentioned it briefly a little yeah. bit a little bit yeah yeah carpenter and his son uh, uh cody carpenter i believe mm -hmm. is his name and then they have a third collaborator whose name eludes me but yeah it was definitely very different from the tangerine dream score from the original film it it epitomized the darker vibe most notably during the opening credits that we got where you were actually getting the chance to see the experimentation in like a little montage bit and in the third act when the big confrontation is coming and you get like the main theme of the film mm -hmm. uh, I, I thought that was really dope that's a track that they had actually released ahead of the film so that stuff was good you know and it really lent to the ominous vibe but once again it's like there's so much talent assembled for this movie and to have the the result be a little lackluster is it's a shame. Yeah, yeah, it is. It, it, it truly is. So, so yeah. I mean, anything else to say about it? I, I just, I, I'm not. Again, I, we've already said both of us that it's not that it's a bad movie. It's just that there were aspects that held it back from being something that is as enjoyable as we were hoping it would be. I suppose. Yeah, and, yeah. And the terrible thing that I'm thinking at, the, at this particular point is that. So I know Stephen King deliberately wrote The Institute as a reactionary thing to the popularity of Stranger Things, but you know one of the biggest aspects that you know Stranger Things kind of copped from Stephen King was the Firestarter aspect with the Eleven character. Not exactly the same, but you know a lot of similarities. And at this point, I feel like Stranger Things did it better, and I hate to say that, but Firestarter's always been a book that I never loved. And it's, you know, I know lots of King fans just adore it and think it's one of the, his, his better offerings. I've never felt that way. And so, yeah, this is just another example of the fact that it's it's always been a property I've, I've just never been that hot on, as I, to, to double down on that. So Fair enough. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's going to do it for our review of 2022's Firestarter. If you guys have seen it, let us know what your thoughts are in the comments down below. It, did you say that it is available on Peacock already? It is, and I, I, I will admit I watched it a second time last night. Oh, really? With, yeah, yeah, with Catherine. So, yeah, just oh. to, just to be, because I felt so conflicted about it when I walked out of the theater, I was like, that was, that was good, but I, I had to give it a second look, especially since it's only like ninety minutes, and hmm. she was curious about it. So yes, it is streaming on on Peacock currently as well. I don't know if I would recommend going out and spending a full ticket price. You know, mm. get a free free Peacock trial or, you know, whatever it is. I think it's like five bucks a month or something for it. Uh, a, a much better use of money and time, I would I would say. So. I would agree with you on that. So, yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys very much for watching. Thank you to all of our patrons for supporting the channel the way that you do. We greatly, greatly appreciate it. Again, if you guys have seen this, let us know what your thoughts are in the comments down below. Until next time, though, I've been Cecil Laird. And gracias, I've been Jaime Fuego. And remember, stay, stay scared. scared.